Hello, everyone. I'm Shane Graves, Director of Program Development at the US-Japan Council. Thank you for joining today's webinar titled Coronavirus and Discrimination Against Asian Americans. As we get started, I have a couple of reminders. This call is on the record and recorded. As a participant, you are automatically on mute and your camera is off. If you would like to ask a question, please do so as soon as you think of your question by typing it into the Q&A section on the Zoom screen. Your questions can only be seen by the panelists, not by all participants. The moderator will get to as many questions as possible, but may, may not be able to ask all of them. When you post your questions into the Q&A box, you may choose to do so anonymously or with your name attached. If your question is selected by the moderator, your question and your name will become public. If you're calling in from a phone rather than joining by Zoom on your computer, you will not have the ability to ask questions. So we encourage you to participate via computer if possible. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Suzanne Basala, USJC's new president and CEO. Thank you, Shane. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar titled Coronavirus and Discrimination Against Asian Americans. I'm grateful for this opportunity to bring you this important and timely discussion as part of our efforts to connect us during this extremely difficult time. I'm also honored to be rejoining USJC to further my commitment to this organization and to build on the legacy of Irene Hirano in a way. I look forward to being able to meet with you virtually over the coming months until we are able to get together in person. As you all know, USJC is an international nonprofit founded by Japanese Americans and whose mission is to develop and connect leaders to create a stronger US-Japan relationship. Events like this are focused on bringing together leaders from across backgrounds, sectors, and generations to partner for a better future for the Asia Pacific region and broader world. Now I'm currently working from Silicon Valley, which is very diverse with a large population of Asian Americans and Asians. And yet here, as in other communities across the country, they have experienced disturbing physical and verbal assaults that are tied to the COVID crisis. As the CEO of US Japan Council, I believe we need to understand what is occurring and identify what we might be able to do together to fight these acts of discrimination and their pernicious effects on our entire society. Today's webinar is a critical contribution to that dialogue and public education. Moderating today is Diane Fukami, a USJC member and alumna of the 2009 Japanese American Leadership Delegation. She's president of Bridge Media Incorporated, a media production and consulting company, and she's an Emmy award-winning TV and media producer. Her work notably includes, among others, stories from Tohoku and Norman Mineta and his legacy, An American Story. She served on the board of key Japanese and Japanese American related organizations, and has represented the US at the 2015 World Assembly for Women in Japan. We are tremendously grateful for her leading the discussion today. So Diane, with no further ado, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and welcome back to you as JC. It's a real pleasure to have you. And also to be joined by this esteemed uh, group of panelists today. I'd like to get dive right on in and give you some introductions. Our first panelist will be Monica S. Carpenter. Monica is uh, the Vice President of Strategic Community Alliance over at Nielsen. Nielsen, as many of you know, is the world's largest consumer research company. Monica is a thought leader on U.S. multicultural consumer insights, and her focus is on Asian Americans. In 2018, she received the Outstanding 50 Asian Americans in Business Awards by Asian American Business Development Center. She currently serves on the board of the National Asian American Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship, and Mariko's parents were born and raised in Japan. Since her father was a diplomat, she moved around a lot as a child, but has been in New York since middle school. Our next panelist is Dr. Mitchell Maki. I told him early on that I would call him Mitch and drop the doctor. Um, Mitch is the president and CEO of the Go For Broke National Education Center. Go For Broke is a nonprofit uh, committed to maintaining the legacy of World War II Nisei veterans and relating that to contemporary life. 
Mitch is a leader in the Japanese American community. He's the lead author of an award-winning book called Achieving the Impossible Dream, How Japanese Americans Obtained Redress. One, he's also one of the leading scholars on the redress movement and is a highly sought public speaker. Although Mitch is from Southern California, his parents are both Japanese Americans from Hawaii. Next, we have assembly, assembly person Yulene New, who is a state assembly uh, member from the New York State Assembly. She is representing the 65th Assembly District, which is the lower Manhattan neighborhoods. That would include the Lower East Side, Chinatown, South Street Seaport Area, Financial District, and Battery Park City. Her advocacy work includes financial empowerment and housing rights. She helped form New York State's first ever Asian Pacific American Legislative Task Force. She was a member of the USJC class of 2018 Asian American Leadership Delegation. She's an immigrant from Taiwan who's lived in Texas, Idaho, and Washington State before going to New York for college and settling there. Thank you all very much for joining us today. So before we get started, what I would like to do is um, I would like to show you a video. And before we start the video, I want to tell you a little bit about it. You know, one of the consequences, unfortunate consequences of, coronavirus, of the coronavirus pandemic, as Suzanne mentioned, is the anti-Asian racism that we're all facing. Since mid-March, organizations such as Stop AAPI Hate have received 1,700 reports of verbal harassment, assaults, and shunning. Many of us have seen these reports on TV or in the news. We put together a, a montage of different incidents so that we can all get on the same page and be oriented in sort of the same manner. There are a couple of historical references that you might see in this video as well. Let's show the videotape. Young woman wearing a mask is attacked in a subway station. Every disease has ever came from China. You dirty Chinese, and he just kept saying that over and over again. I've never felt anything like this before. Why are they being racist to us? We don't even have the coronavirus. Get out! The virus of hate is running rampant. This man and his two children stabbed at a Sam's Club. He was walking down the street last week when four people attacked him. There's been a lot of xenophobia against folks who are part of our Asian community. Many in our Asian American neighborhoods are reporting that foot traffic is down and business has slowed to a halt. It's been unleashed and it's something that I think is fueling anti-Asian sentiment. We don't think that um, the anti-Asian sentiment that we're seeing now is going to go away, and we're going to need to address that as a society. Black, Hispanic, and Asian congressional leaders uniting to condemn racism. Come together as Americans. When we stand together as a community, we celebrate our Chinese community in this city. We are proud of that. Please. Please stop the prejudice and senseless violence against Asian people. You guys, I'm not a virus. Yeah, so in addition to trying to stay alive and keep healthy, we're also facing a lot of other issues out there as well. You know, when we had um, an earlier pre-conference phone call and we got to know each other a little bit better, um, I was so saddened to hear that Mariko has had a personal experience with this type of racism, this type of discrimination. So I'd like to kick things off by asking Mariko a little bit about that. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everyone. And um, thank you, USJC, for hosting this webinar. Um, it's something that's very near and dear to, to me. Uh, you know, back in March, 
Right when uh, this whole thing started, I actually uh, wore, decided to wear my mask for the first time. And it was still at a time where not everybody was wearing a mask and there was this debate of whether we should or should not. Um, but so I put the mask on and I walked my dog like I normally do in New York City. Oh, here, I, I, I'm in New York City, by the way. Um, and as soon as I left my uh, building, only a block away, I was uh, approached uh, by a man who was really angry, um, cursing, approaching me, uh, towards me. There wasn't a lot of people out on the street. Uh, and so I picked up my dog and um, ran to the, the nearest garage, which is where I, I, I parked my, uh, my garage. And I have to say, I've been in New York since middle school, so many, many years. Um, and it really took this, it was this pandemic that really showed me uh, the ugliness of xenophobia and the discrimination. I've been in New York for, you know, I've seen a lot of things, we've gone through a lot. Um, but this was a time when I felt, it felt like it was so out of control. Uh, and, um, and this happened in my neighborhood, a place where I walk every day. I walk my dogs three times a day. Um, and so uh, something that hit me hard, hard personally, um, and something that, you know, and as a result of it, I, you know, I decided to write an op-ed uh, where I talked about this incident and I worked for Nielsen. And so I, I, I sort of went, dove into the facts to talk about how we're, we're, we're contributors to this country, to the health of this country in so many ways. Um, but I really, uh, you know, I find that I really appreciate this forum today um, that we are having this conversation because I fear at this moment what, what is to come when, the, when it is open again. And when children are back together in a classroom or in a, in, a, in, a, in a different setting, and when we all mingle again, because I think uh, to some degree we've been in sheltering in place, which has helped us uh, helped us to sort of stay 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 away. So yeah, that especially is a is a real worry. You know, when we leave our homes, when we start mingling again, what will we be facing? Um, Yulene, you can perhaps give us a little bit of insight into what's going on in New York now. I mean, both you and Monica are experiencing the highest number of cases in the country. Uh, it's got to be something unbelievable. Luckily, here in California, you know, we're, we've, been, we've been lucky to dodge that bullet, so to speak. But you're in the heart of it, Yulene. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and what you're experiencing there. Sure. Um, I mean, my district is actually uh, Chinatown as well. Um, so I think that a lot of times, um, you know, we uh, start to see the ramifications of some of these things uh, earlier on. So, um, you know, my district actually, I, I say that, you know, we've been facing two epidemics. One is um, the virus. The other one is xenophobia and racism. We obviously um, started to see our businesses uh, seeing less foot traffic starting uh, pr pretty much end of January. People started to see it before there was even a single case of the coronavirus in New York. So, you know, this was based off of people um, just stereotyping, um, you know, spreading really hateful messages, um, you know, calling Asian food unhygienic, calling our markets unhygienic and dirty. And uh, it's been very uh, hurtful, some of the things that have been said. Um, you know, a lot of the video, when people saw that, uh, most of those uh, videos were taken here in New York, on the subway, in the subway stops, on the street, we've seen a demonization of Asian Americans uh, throughout our city, throughout our nation. And it's been very difficult for our community because we've experienced a lot of uh, the hardship starting, um, starting January and just the spike in Asian, Asian American xenophobia, anti-Asian sentiment and racism has been uh, very uh, extreme. I mean, people called my office just to tell me that I ate bats and to say that, you know, I should get a, a walk so I can fry up cats and dogs. Um, you know, when you walk out the doorway, people will just look at you and be like, Corona, Corona, Corona. You know, it's just, it's, uh, it's been very, um, it's been, it's been very harmful, I think, to our Asian American community. And uh, folks probably know right now, um, it was just announced um, that there was 
the city is launching like a hundred thousand dollar effort to combat anti-Asian discrimination. Um, and that might sound like a lot of money to folks, but it's nothing. It's really nothing. That's like, uh, like 15 ads. <laughs> so if you really think about it that way, um, it's very disappointing what the response is from the city. Um, and on the state level, we luckily have our attorney general, Tish James, being willing to put together a hotline for anti-Asian actions, um, racially biased incidents and uh, hate crimes to be reported to the AG's office so that they can have a good documentation at least, um, whether or not you know, there can be uh, more things done, we don't know yet, but I do know that there's been good documentation. She's been getting a lot of calls and uh, it's very heartbreaking to see. And in my district, we've seen delivery workers who dropped off food and had their, um, you know, had, had their uh, customer literally just spit on them in the eye. Uh, we've had healthcare workers who, had patients refuse to have them work on them just because they're Asian American. We've had people literally risking their lives trying to save other people's lives and they are called the virus. So uh, it's, been, it's been hard here in New York. It's so sad to hear you, Lee. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, unfortunately, many of us know that this the, the, these incidents are not new, you know, there's, and those of you who are watching the video carefully saw especially two specific references to historical things that have happened against Asian Americans. Um, Mitch, tell us a little bit about, you know, you and I are about the same age. You're younger though, I'll give you that. But um, tell us a little bit about the his, historical stuff that you have experienced and, um, and, and why this feels cyclical to you. Well, thank you, Diane. And first of all, thank you to the U.S. Japan Council for hosting this very important discussion. And I want to start off by applauding Yulin and, and Mariko for the work that they do. I mean, with Yulin, political representation and advocacy are critical to making our voice heard and our presence felt. So thank you for the work that you do. And Mariko, your use of data is critical in helping Americans know that not only we as Asian Americans, but Americans of all colors and backgrounds contribute to the diversity and the strength of our nation. So thank you both for the work that you do. Um, you know, in answer to your question, Diane, I, I had shared with you that I was a bit hesitant uh, to agreeing to come on this panel because uh, as a traditional sansei, I'm feeling the same anger, concern, frustration, that we all are, but there's a part of me that's saying, man, we went through this already. We go through this all the time. And I mean, 80 years ago, Japanese Americans were rounded up and thrown into concentration camps simply because our ethnicity was the same as that of Japan, you know, the, the enemy at that time. You know, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, Vietnamese refugees in Texas uh, were harassed and threatened by the Klan because they were threatening white fishermen's uh, livelihood, you know, even though these folks had migrated here lawfully to America. 35 years ago, a Chinese American brother, Vincent Chin, was literally followed out of a nightclub, tracked down, stalked, and beaten to death with baseball bats because he was mistaken for being Japanese in a time of Japan bashing. Um, around that same time, the Japanese American community and all communities that cherish the Constitution were fighting for an apology in the form of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. You know, 20 years ago, after 9-11, we see a spike in anti-Muslim and anti-Middle Eastern hatred. And the victims of that were Muslim Americans and Middle Eastern Americans. So, you know, to me, in short, the lesson is that the devil of racism never goes away. Sometimes it's very prominent and sometimes it may seem dormant, but it's always there. And so I think one of the lessons for all of us today is that the fight that we're fighting right now, the fight that we're engaged in is not just for today and it's not just for tomorrow, but it's for the generations to come because racism will continue to be with us. You know, one of the questions that we just received is, let me read it to you. 
Um, Rena Van Tyne has asked, where are these horrible incidents most prevalent right now? And are the reports like this all over the country? Um, any of you care to, to take that question on? Because from what I've seen, Yulene, although many of the incidents are from the New York area, this is pretty widely distributed. Obviously, most of the concentration is on the East Coast and the West Coast, where the Asian American uh, population is the most dense and, and the most present. But I don't think any community has really been um, insulated from this. So do, any, any difference of opinion there? And to sort of show that, what, here's what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a poll right now. Um, been talking to the USJC team and they're ready for this. So the poll question for you is, have you or someone you know experienced anti-Asian racism since the pandemic started? So go ahead and just click on to either yes, no, or I'm not sure. We'll give you a few seconds to, to take care of this poll and then we'll, re we'll reveal the results of our answer later. Okay, so let's move on then. Um, you know, Mariko, you, you talked a little bit about the Asian American contributions. Give us a little more about that. Yeah, so, you know, I think um, Mitch is so right when, it, when he talks about uh, this having been, ha that's happened before, it is rep uh, repetitive in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think what has changed today is this rise in Asian American consciousness that has really led to a louder, uh, influential sort of community voice. Um, you know, I go in front of, in my role at Nielsen, in front of big American brands, right? So retailers like your Walmarts and your Targets, to media giants like Warner Brothers and Disney, and to talk about our community as consumers and why they need to pay attention to us uh, as consumers. Because we've been actually invisible in that area as well. A lot of marketers are like, oh, we don't need to talk, you know, invest in Asian Americans. They're just part of our general general market, right? Um, but we actually, ha that might have been the case and that has been the excuse uh, for when we were disparate, a community of disparate immigrant groups, right? But today, that's changed. That's, that's really, really different, different. We're not just you know, um, contributing as consumers and taxpayers and voters, but we're influencers. You know, why and how? It's because through the, the, right, the introduction of digital, it has changed everything for Asian Americans when it comes to sort of our collective voice and us uh, being able to have a platform uh, that is now very, very influential. We've galvanized right around our larger community that we hadn't in the past, um, particularly the U.S. born, right? Because now we we created this community through digital, really, that really showcased that we have so many commonalities, right? Um, we are immigrants. We don't have a have you know issues with the long sense of belonging because we we don't really belong anywhere. Um, but we've really galvanized around that, and we've actually created so many like. Asian American digital platforms like Next Shark, and you have the Juggernaut, which is like South Asian narrative stories. Um, and I think what has happened is that we've sort of shifted from self interest to the Asian American interest. Um, and, you know, we have Asian American fashion designers who are supporting Asian American movies. You have Asian American celebrities supporting Asian American uh, API elected official, right? So all of that really speaks to our contribution, um, you know, to the democracy of this country in ways I think that we haven't in the past. Uh, you know, we've built a community that has, it, it, it's a powerful platform this, that, that we've created on digital. Um, so, you know, it's not just all only di like leaders of our community that's using the platform, but all of us as individuals, as Asian Americans, uh, you know, every time we do a post, every time we do it, we share an article, we do a like, 
all of that is amplified through social media and we're all doing doing our part and raising our voice um so i think you know we are of course contributing to the health of this country we have the highest you know aggregate uh, uh um income from a household level income level uh we're well educated as a group um and you know we're con contributing we're creating jobs we have small business owners but really we're also uh, contributing in, in culturally, we're contributing to really I, uh, to the democracy of this country. So, which is why it makes me so mad uh, about this, 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 uh, you know, this discrimination that we're facing. May I add? Yes, go ahead, Yuling. I was just gonna say that, you know, yes, we've been more visible, but you know, the, the things that uh, Mitch talked about kind of uh, also, you know, we are still seeing play out, right? I mean, let's talk about the model minority myth. Let's talk about the perpetual foreigner syndrome. Let's talk about um, a invisibilization that's been kind of plaguing all of us for a very, very long time, right? I think that in uh, politics, as you just mentioned, like all of these different things where there's a lot of, um, you know, movement and a little bit of space building for Asian American representation. But in our own politics, I am the only Asian American woman in the entire New York State Legislature, still. It is 2020. We are over 13% of this state's population. We have less than 2% of this state's representation. That causes us to be invisibilized in our budget, in our discussions about healing even for this time. Um, it, talk, it, it really um, makes it so that we're not represented on the governmental level. We're not represented in the visibility level. We're not represented in the discussions and we're not having a seat at the table. And so I think that um, it's really important that we are actually talking about that because, you know, John Cho wrote an incredible article. I don't know if you guys saw that, but it was very, very beautiful in the sense that it really kind of encapsulated the Asian American experience here in the United States. And, and he said one line that really kind of wrapped up the perpetual foreigner syndrome, which meant, you know, which, which so it said, I think um, that our belonging is conditional. Our belonging is conditional. And, and, and that was something that hit me so hard because that is exactly what the perpetual foreigner syndrome is, right? Because it's, it's saying that we, you know, people can, you know, buffet us or whatever it is, but they, they're, they're not accepting us um, as American, as part of the American fabric. And um, that you can see throughout. You know, you can see throughout. And I think that that is something that, you know, we are seeing right now in who we are funding for healthcare, who we are making sure has services in our social benefit system, who, we, who is actually getting language access services. You know, there are certain things that are just not being paid for on our state budget. In fact, until I was elected, Asian American never once showed up in the New York state budget. So. And if I can jump in now, I, in fact, I don't think you need to speak anymore. The three of us will just take it away right now. But I think what you're hearing is a lot of different truth from a lot of different perspectives. And I really liked what Monica was pointing, going at in terms of, you know, Asian Americans have made such a tremendous contribution and now to this nation. And now we have data that we can point to, to to prove that. And I certainly would rather be Japanese American today in 2020 than Japanese American in 1942, because I'd be in Manzanar in 1942, right? But the other part of that is that that's a very rational argument to a very irrational feeling of hate and of oppression that racism represents. And I was talking to a good friend of mine just the other day. His name's John Davis, African-American. Uh, he's the Dean of the College of Education at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And when we were talking about this, you know, he said that he and his education colleagues got together and were asking themselves, where did we as teachers, and where did we as a nation fail in teaching proper respect of one another? You know, and, and, and that's what we've got to start thinking about is how do we begin to teach how irrational racism is, how irrational hatred of people are by their color and by their nation of origin. And we got to start doing that now because the truth is that guy who stabbed the man at, at uh, Sam's Club and his two kids, we're not going to change him. We're not going to give him data and change his mind, but hopefully we can reach out to the children in his neighborhood, you know, and so that we will have Americans in the future 
that can contribute to a, a more productive and more inclusive society than we have right now. Well, Mariko, you know, you're in the media. The media is so influential in so many ways. Do you have ideas on we can help to change hearts and minds via media? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, you, what, what Yulene was talking about in terms of representation is so important, you know, in the media. So even in, you know, when you have news uh, of, of frontline workers who are risking their lives and helping, there needs to be Asian Americans being interviewed in that news piece, right? Um, I, think, I think it's so important for us to be uh, there, us to be represented, because otherwise, if, you know, media is what, you, what people perceive the role to be. So if you're not in the friend group, uh, then you don't know, you must not exist in, in schools. You know, if, if there's no Asian American who is a teacher on TV, then Asian American must not be teachers, right? So it's, it's really this representation, I think, in media is so critical. Um, and so, uh, and you know, and there are so many good Asian American uh, nonprofit organizations that are really championing that. So I really encourage all of our Asian Americans community to come out and support support those organizations that are really uh, pushing pushing for representation. You know, this might be a good time to mention that near the end of our panel discussion today, we've prepared two things to share with you. One is a list of tips on how you can counter and combat Asian American racism. And the other is some website addresses on organizations that you can go and visit to get more information and additional resources. So we'll be making those available. And I understand from our USJC team too, that as soon as this is over, we, I think they, you send out feedback and we can also, um, if, if you like that, we can attach those as well. Um, you know, so what about this concept of proving that we're American, that we're more American than everybody else. You know, Andrew Yang had mentioned that and got a lot of, he got a lot of blowback on that. I mean, how, how do you guys feel about this? Um, as a personal friend of mine, I really love Andrew. And I think that he, um, I think he meant well. And I think that, I think that, you know, um, you know, every single one of us has to deal with a little bit of the internalized oppression that we all hold. And I think that a lot of times um, that internalized oppression is, is so real. And it, it's a, it's a uh, offshoot of exactly what John Cho was writing about, right? Which was the perpetual foreigner syndrome of, um, of that like we have to prove that we are American enough. Like we have to prove somehow. And I, and I still remember there was this uh, very particular, my friend Rami Ko was actually the person, but uh, there was a particular uh, Congresswoman who was talking about how like, why is it that Asian Americans can't make their names American and, and easier for folks to pronounce. Do you remember this? And uh, Ramey had to be like, well, they are American. We're all American, you know? What, what's the difference between somebody named Jeremiah and somebody who's named uh, Mariko, right? And like, so there's like, a, 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 there is an inherent um, decision on what is American and what is not American. And I think that there's an othering of us and, and it makes it so that, um, you know, I think that a lot of us grow up with that thinking, you know, and I still remember my parents, you would even say, you know, oh, you know, you have to work twice as hard to even be seen as equal, you know, and or like you'd work even more hard because you're Asian and you're a woman, you know, and just, just there's just these things that get put into us and then we internalize them and we like hold on to them as as truths and these are narratives that we tell ourselves but in, in actuality you know, we're just as American. And the thing is, um, there should be nothing that we have to do to prove ourselves. And there should be nothing that we have to do to, to, to make this hate go away or something. We don't have to do anything about it. It should just not exist, right? We should not have to do anything about it. We should not have to prove anything. And it should just not be happening to us, right? And, and, and I think that that is, the, that is the messaging that has to be put forward um, and, and say that, you know, it's wrong. To, to, to ask us to prove anything. It's wrong to ask us to not, you know, to somehow feel like we're not belonging. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things I think that it's part of that internalized oppression. It's just part of it, you know, and, and it's something that so many of us uh, 
you know, had to navigate. Mitch, I'm going to go to you next because it's the day after Memorial Day. Your organization um, honors the contributions that uh, Japanese Americans veterans made um, during World War II. You see this on an ongoing basis. T tell us what you're thinking right now. Well, I really can't tell you what I'm thinking because we're live and, and censored if I told you what I'm thinking. But, you know, uh, I categorically reject that notion that we need to prove how American we are. I grew up believing in America's promise. You know, the promise that in our nation, no one is to be judged by the color of their skin, the God that they worship, or the nation from which they come. And that's true for people of all colors. And there is no requirement. There is no necessity as written by the constitution or, or uh, any other document that says you have to prove that you belong here or that you have to prove your worth. Because if we, if we buy into that, then we buy into what Eulene was talking about of this personal self-doubt and this personal um, feeling that we are less than. Rather than proving how American we are, we need to be promoting America's promise and we need to be promoting the notion that racism is wrong. Racism is what we should be fighting, not the sense that somehow certain people are less than because of the way they look, the country from, they, uh, from which they come, or the God whom they worship. So, you know, I, I agree. I think Andrew meant well, but uh, this is not the 1940s when Japanese American soldiers had no choice but to demonstrate their loyalty on the battlefield. You know, it's a different time and place and we should act accordingly because otherwise the legacy of our Japanese American veterans would have been lost. Mariko, did you want to, Mariko, did you want to add anything? No, I, I totally, I agree with both Yulene and Mitch wholeheartedly. All right, this might be a good time then to show those poll results, you know? Um, so the original question was how many of you have experienced yourself or um, know someone who's experienced anti-Asian racism? And so there's our poll results, you know, 42% have, 40% have not, and 18% aren't quite sure, uh, which is a little bit different than a national poll that I saw. And unfortunately, I can't remember the source of that poll, but um, in that poll, I think when they surveyed Asian Americans, 78% said that they had known or experienced uh, racism themselves, which was a mind-boggling number to me and a, a real sad commentary on, on what we're going through. Um, you know, one of the things that, th that people are asking is what can we do to combat this racism? Um, how can we get in front of this? What's, what do we have to do? Uh, Yulene, thoughts on, on some of those solutions that, and things that you might see working already in New York? Um, I mean, right now, it's, it's a pretty big thing to kind of talk about solutions, I guess. I, I think, you know, what Mitch was saying, which is so key, right? Like, we should just be saying that racism is wrong. Um, it's pretty hard to kind of, uh, you know, move past that piece, right, until it happens. Um, like I said, you know, we tried to do this. I, I, I saw that the city launched this effort, and on the state level, we have this hotline. These are different solutions, I guess, to call it out and say that it's wrong. But at the same time, I, I wouldn't say that, um, I wouldn't say that, you know, $100,000 is all that useful. Uh, but I, I think that um, one of the things that I actually just get hope from is the fact that uh, our communities are really kind of helping each other out and spreading messages and of, of solidarity and unity and hope. And I think that that in itself is really powerful. And uh, that in itself is um, moving and, and changing. You know, and I think that 
Um, we saw a lot of that in, so I, I don't know, a lot of folks probably on the call know me from being a young activist in Seattle, Washington, following around Sharon Tomiko Santos <laughs> and Uncle Bob Santos. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we saw there was a solidarity amongst all of our different multicultural ethnic ethnicities and our community groups. And, um, you know, you saw Uncle Bob and his four amigos, right? And they uh, bridged a gap between um, all of our different communities because instead of being forced to fight over the same piece of pie, they were just like, we're not gonna do that. We want all the pie, you know? And I think that that's really kind of some of the things that we're talking about now because as like I said, you know, Asian Americans weren't even listed in our state budget, but I think it's so important that we're not saying like, oh, hey, you know, we want this from this budget and that from that budget. What, we're, what we need to say is Asian Americans deserve our own pot of money for making sure that we have a voice, making sure that we have, you know, adult language services and, and, and language access and benefits. And, you know, people don't know this about uh, Asian Americans in New York, but we are literally the most impoverished ethnic group. One in four Asian Americans lives in poverty. Um, one in six Asian American seniors are homeless. It is a heartbreaking thing when people think that we've got it all figured out and the model minority myth plays out because we don't get benefits. We don't get service. Asian Americans are, even with that level of poverty, even with that level of need, still the, the, the lowest amount of social services and benefits goes to Asian Americans here in New York. And so these are facts that cannot, you know, can't really, can't really um, show us like a lot of hope in the sense that we are going to fix these things and, 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 and um, change these things overnight. But, but I do think that we now have, you know, four Asian Americans in the New York State Legislature. You know, we doubled the amount from two to four uh, this last election. I think that we have more and more representation. We have the APA task force now. We have folks finally focusing on Asian American legislative issues. Uh, we finally passed the Data Disaggregation Act through uh, both houses. I think that, you know, we have a, a opportunity right now to look at all of the different things that COVID had shined a light on um, that, that really showed us all of the different things that we did not get as a community and that we needed help in. And all of it is coming out, all of it is being shown. And I think that this is an opportunity to look at all of those, those, those needs and fix them and, and know that this is not a broken system this is not a broken system. This is a system that is working exactly the way that it was designed. It was designed to leave out particular communities and benefit other communities. And I think that it's really important that we recognize that because this is not about a fix. This is not about people slipping through the cracks. This is about, this is about making sure that we dismantle a system that is racist and inherently racist. Communities like mine have been redlined out of insurance, redlined out of banks, red light out of possibilities and opportunities. And I think that it's really important that we are fixing things on a, a, a fundamental level in all of our different systems in the sense that we have to change those systems completely. You know, right now might be a good time to take a look at some of the steps that we're capable of doing. And albeit these are not quick fixes, nor are they easy fixes, but we've got to find a way to try to move forward a little bit. Um, we put, I put this list together and I borrowed heavily from Dr. Tobin miller Schuer over at the University of Montana and the Mike Mansfield Center, um, a little bit from Hollaback, which as you know does intervention training, and the Japanese American Citizens League. So the first thing would be, and we've talked about this during our panel today, is to acknowledge that there is a history of anti-Asian racism and to continue to educate others about it as as uh, Mitch has emphasized. Use social networking to amplify anti-Asian racism and condemn it. And that's something that Monica had talked about too, is that, you know, many of us, some of us feel uncomfortable ab about raising visibility or being out there in public, but there are a lot of little things that you can do at home that can help. Oppose and reject racist language. 
I'm not even going to mention the name of the virus that people keep referring to. Um, call for federated, I mean, was, I'm sorry, call for federal coordinated response. And the reason I put this in is I found something that I did not know before. You know, when 9-11 happened and there was the anti-Arab, anti-Muslim um, sentiment going on and also SARS and there was the beginning of anti-Asian um, uh, uh, racism going on, the feds start, uh, started funding policies and strategy to combat that kind of discrimination and racism very early on. Nothing has been done yet about the racism that Asian Americans are facing about coronavirus. And so we need to call upon our elected leaders and compel them to do something about this and to let them know that this is important to us. And then one of the things that the panelists mentioned too is to contribute to Asian American Pacific Islander nonprofits and businesses and to let our allies know that we're there, we're supporting them, and that we, can, we want them to continue the work that they're doing. If we can see the next slide as well. These are a little more personal, you know, and I don't know about our audience back there, and I'm gonna to jump to bullet point number two that says practice your own reaction. You know, as I listen to my fellow panelists speak, as I see that video, you know, it shakes me to my core. And I wonder, what would I do if something like that happened to me? And the one thing I do know is that I don't want to be stunned into paralysis. Um, and that could very well happen. So practice your own reaction, I think, is a good preventative measure um, so that you aren't totally shocked and unable to react in any way. Then going, oops, what happened there? Okay. <laughs> and then going back, equip yourself and others with in-the-moment tools. And if you look at the Hollaback site, and some of the others, they give you some tools about distracting an incident as it happens, delegate by getting help from someone else, documenting an incident, if it's safe, take photos or videos, um, and make sure that you report it, direct. So if it's, if it's safe to do so, speak directly to the harasser, you know, why are you doing this? I don't understand, I don't understand what you're saying, you know. Delay, after the incident is over, check in with the victim if the victim is not yourself. Okay, then going down to the third major bullet point, prepare children for potential harassment. And I'm gonna ask Monica to speak a little bit about this more. Document and report. So insist that all the incidents are reported and that they be classified as a hate crime. You know, the hate crime carries different kinds of penalties, more severe penalties. And there will be some law enforcement who will hesitate to report something as a hate crime. So you or a witness must insist that it be reported as a hate crime. And then the other thing is to alert organizations and local commissions that deal with these types of things so that they can amplify the incidents that are happening and that we can all learn that these are not isolated incidents in small parts of the country, but this is a trend, this is a frightening trend, and that we need to band together to do something about it. So on that note, Monica, will you talk a little bit about about children and, and although your children are teenagers, how you've had to deal with that and ex explain and sort of get them protected? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like all parents, um, uh, obviously, you know, I have to have these conversations with them on, on what happened to me and what potentially could happen to them. and and uh, just, you know, being a lot more alert. Um, but I, I have to also say that kids these days, they're much more engaged, right? Um, you know, media is all over, you can't stop it. It's not like you just shut the TV off and then there's no media. Um, and so it's really, I think, channeling, channeling them to really understand the other side too. I think empathy is really big. I think that's something that we've learned through COVID-19 um, to really understand uh, why, why something is, you know, the other, the, the other side, the other side of the story. Um, and also really engage with things that are happening that's not just about us, right? If there's a racist, racism going on about another community of color to really use their power and their voice to speak up for that as well. So we're not just, uh, you know, what we're going through as AAPIs, like we, 
other communities or colors are going through uh, the same and even worse, right? So um, I think just doing what they know best, which is to really voice and amplify through social media and you learning to use that channel to uh, speak up for our community, but also for the broader, broader communities of color. One of the questions that we received is how can discrimination be stopped at school? And as a parent, what can you do to prevent that from happening? Mitch, you've been a, you've been a teacher, um, although not of young children. Do you have any, um, any advice on, on what parents can do? Well, I think the answer is that it depends so much on the circumstances, but I think a general piece of advice is for parents to be involved to be involved with your kids, to have that discussion of what's happening in the class, you know, uh, what was said either by the teacher or by the other kids, and what was the response. And if, if parents are involved, then they can go to the teacher if it's the children who are uh, acting inappropriately. And if they don't get the proper response from the teacher, they then go to the administrator. But you only can do that, and you can only be effective uh, if you're involved with your own children, so you know what's happening. And secondly, if you know the other parents and know the other uh, teachers and administrators at a school. And like anything else, there's strength in numbers. You know, so reach out to the other parents because if you're upset, chances are other parents are upset also. Thanks, Mitch. One of the other questions we got is that when, when incidents like this happen, and this is from Kevin Maher, who many of us know, when incidents like this happen, what kind of support are we finding in the white community? Oh, Yulene, I see you smiling. You, you have a response for that one? Uh, uh, not really a response, I guess. I think that there isn't uh, the kind of, I mean, there's, there's, um, you know, everybody has certain allies and folks that, you know, will, are, are very understanding and, um, you know, are good on the topics and understand how to respond. And I just think that there's a lot more people now uh, taking upstander and bystander training. I think that that's really a good practice. I think that's very helpful. Um, and, you know, I think that we, we don't really talk about the white community. I don't know how to frame that as a thing. Um, it's a bit puzzling, I guess, for me to think of that. I guess one of the big things is that when world leadership, when you're talking about your own president and congressional members saying certain things that are hurtful to our community, uh, it's, it's uh, a demonstration, I guess, of what, um, what is allowable in a lot of ways to many folks. And I think that that's very dangerous and very har uh, hurtful and harmful. Uh, I think that there is um, there is a, a a bit of uh, a lack of or a void one would say um, of a true message um, of anti racism and anti discrimination uh, in this country. I think that we have uh, a lot of anti blackness. Uh, anti-brownness, anti-Asianness, and I think that there is a uh, link to all of them, and that is, of course, to uh, keep white supremacy. <laughs> and so there, there is that link. Uh, I think that I wouldn't say white community ever. I think that it's just really, um, there's a power imbalance for that. You know, if I can add to that, I think there's an assumption in that question to a certain degree that the white community has a unique lock on racism. And I don't think that that's the case. You know, now certainly we're seeing a rise in white supremacy and that's a whole nother dynamic and so forth. But I've, I have seen members of the white community, some of my white friends be leaders uh, in empathy and being leaders in an anti-racist anti stance. I've seen African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, all being in the right position of standing up for inclusion and diversity. And I've seen members of those same communities, white, yellow, brown, black, whatever, be as racist as anyone else. You know, so I think really the question is, how do we develop a community, not of people of colors, 
but how do we develop a community of people who understand that inclusion and diversity is a strength of our nation? And how do we reach out to those individuals? And how do we limit the influence, of, as Mariko and, and Yulene have been talking about, limit the influence of those who feel, feel like racism is an appropriate stance to take? I, and I'll just add, I think it's hard when um, the leadership isn't leading by example. I, I will say that, you know, I feel like it's, it's, it's really hard, especially when you're talking to your children, uh, when some of it is happening from a leader, from our leaders. I think on that note, we'll end with today's panel discussion. I want to, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, Mariko Carpenter, Yuli New, Mitch Maki, and also Shane Graves and the US Japan team for making this happen. Um, thank you for having us today. This is an important topic and perhaps there will be a part two um, at some point. Suzanne, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Diane, for that just amazing conversation. And you did, of course, a beautiful job moderating it and bringing out some really important points. And thank you for pulling this together. And for Mariko, Mitch, and Yulene, thank you so much for your honesty and for sharing your stories and for giving us some tips on how we can help address the anti-Asian discrimination and its negative effects in our own lives and in our communities. On behalf of the council, I hope that you found it worthwhile to attend today's event and thank you for participating. Um, and I truly hope that all of us can keep this critical conversation going after we sign out of this webinar. It's just critically important. Um, so um, with that, thank you. And now I will turn it back over to Shane. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you to each of our speakers for that really timely and informative dialogue. Um, as Suzanne was saying, I, I, we just hope that all of you watching today will deeply consider uh, the issues that were discussed and think about how um, to be a part of the solution and um, progress now and going forward. Um, as Diane mentioned earlier, once this webinar concludes, in a minute or so, you, the participants, will be redirected to a feedback survey. And we'll also send you a follow-up email, uh, including that same survey. We would love to hear your thoughts so that we can continue to offer programming that's relevant to you. Also, a copy of this webinar will be posted on our website. So if you want to view it again or share it with others, please visit the USJC's website to do so and to find out about additional upcoming programming. And lastly, as you know, this is a particularly challenging period for nonprofits and USJC is uh, no exception. Your support will help USJC be able to continue to offer similar free events to connect people around key topics in the US and uh, Japan relationship and communities. Please consider giving a tax deductible donation through our website, which is listed in the chat function. So thank you everyone. And we hope you all join us again for our future programming.